The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good evening, everyone. This is Jim Ostrowski. I work in the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energies, Environmental Support Division. I welcome you to our Michigan High Water Virtual Town Hall. This is the second town hall that we've hosted. Uh, this one is focused on Great Lakes shoreline erosion and permitting issues. I got a great evening plan for you. That's me. I'm your moderator, Jim Ostrowski, like I said. Uh, just some basic webinar housekeeping. I know we've got a lot of people uh, registered. We've got well over a thousand people that registered for today's webinar and everybody's coming on pretty quickly right now. Uh, but just as you're coming on, a couple uh, basic housekeeping guidelines. First of all, and that's all lines are muted, which means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. If you do have a question tonight, feel free to type it into the GoToWebinar question box that you have on your toolbar there over to your right. You'll see there's a drop down tab, just click on that. And uh, what's gonna happen is the questions will come into me and at the end of our presentations, we will go through those questions and have our panelists answer them the best they can. Uh, we're also recording tonight's town hall webinar and I'll be posting that soon, as soon as I can get it out there. So if you need to leave early or have somebody else that wants to watch it, it will be available for, for you to view. Uh, just as a reminder for questions, there's a little drop down so you can type your questions in and I'm anticipating a lot of questions. So we might not get through all of them. If we don't, don't worry, we're keeping track of them. And uh, if we have to get back to you directly, we will. All right, with that, I'm gonna have uh, Jared Sanders join us. And uh, Jared, you want to say a few words about tonight's agenda? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Jared Sanders. I'm the uh, Assistant Division Director in Water Resources Division in, in Eagle, the division that does a lot of the permitting and regulatory work along the lakeshore. Um, uh, many of you may have tuned in the last time we did one of these webinars, which was more of a broad swath of all of the high water impacts that we were seeing sort of across the state and it has really touched you know, all areas of the state. So tonight we're gonna to focus really more on um, Great Lakes shoreline processes and uh, permitting. Sorry, um, I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, that's my you? iPhone, uh, Siri's trying to talk to me. Apologize everyone. Um, so the last time I didn't do a very good job of explaining, um, you know, the processes and how the permitting process, uh, the shoreline process and how the permitting process sort of tries to manage that balance between the need to protect property and to also protect the Great Lakes and the processes that are out there. Um, and so that's really what we want to focus on today is so that the people that attend have a better idea of what their options are uh, in terms of protecting their property along the Great Lakes um, and sort of what they can expect and sort of how to get started uh, in that. So we're pretty excited. We have a uh, seven, I think, panelists, including myself, that Jim is going to try to juggle and, and keep everyone um, on track. We want to um, leave as much time as we can at the end for questions. So we're going to move through some of this stuff quickly. And if there's, you know, you have something that you want to know a little bit more about, um, you know, please send a question in because we want to leave a half an hour or, or more as much as possible to have the town hall part of this town hall meeting. So um, that's all I have for now. I'll uh, be back on it a little bit, but you can take it from there. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jared. Um, just want to remind everybody, too, that, you know, hey, we're all coming from remote locations. So uh, bear with us tonight as we go all over the state for get our different pre presenters on. Uh, so that's a unique thing that uh, we've had to adapt to. All right, so I just want to quickly give the panelists a chance to introduce themselves. So, uh, Daniel, you on the line, you want to say a few words? Hi, um, I'm Daniel Dietz, Vice President of Dietz House Moving Engineers Incorporated. Uh, personally, I've been moving houses for 45 years. Uh, our company was started by my grandfather, Walter Dietz, in 1945, so our company is in its 75th year of existence. Uh, right now, it's being operated by third and fourth generation. Uh, I'm also past president of the International Association of Structural Movers. 
All right, thanks, Daniel. Uh, next panelist is uh, Brian Micah. Brian? Hi, my name is Brian Micah. I am a restoration ecologist with GEI Consultants, and I'm based out of Allendale, Michigan. Uh, GEI is a science and engineering consulting firm. Uh, we have about 800 people from across the country. Uh, one of the things that I specialize in within GEI is the use of living shorelines to stabilize eroding uh, shorelines. So living shorelines mimic natural processes and use plant roots to stabilize eroding areas uh, along Great Lakes shorelines and adjacent waters. Uh, to, in, order to, in order to minimize erosion while also creating uh, habitat. So uh, I've done a lot of work with both the design and implementation of all different types of natural systems uh, all throughout the Great Lakes. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And John, go ahead. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. I'm John Vihar, I work for Eagle in the Kalamazoo District Office. I do shoreline permitting and floodplain work. And I've been doing it since 2013. Thanks, John. And going to Corey next. Hi, yes, I'm Corey Brown. I am with the Water Resources Division um, within the Grand Rapids District area. Um, I currently cover the Great Lakes Critical Dune High Risk Permitting along the shoreline, as well as some of the Inland Lake Wetland and Stream Permitting. All right, thanks, Corey. I just want to remind all of our panelists to look at your lines because they're getting a little bit of an echo if you're not. So mute your line if you're not talking. All right, uh, Dr. Guy Meadows. Good evening, everyone. I hope uh, hope you're all well and, and staying safe. Um, I uh, started working on the uh, shoreline uh, quite a while ago uh, as an undergraduate at at uh, Michigan State, I uh, gave up my job you know, as a cook in the dormitory to work with a professor who was looking at how waves transform across natural beaches, uh, a project supported by the Office of Naval Research. Um, that was in 1969. And uh, the Office of Naval Research was very interested in the severity of waves uh, on Lake Michigan in particular and the impact they have on the shoreline and how that changed. And uh, as they say, that uh, changed my life forever. I uh, followed that professor to Purdue University and finished my graduate work uh, and then uh, was hired by the University of Michigan uh, as an assistant professor and worked my way up through the ranks and spent 35 years in the College of Engineering at U of M uh, doing ocean engineering and nearshore hydrodynamics until 2012 when Michigan Technological University created the Great Lakes Research Center, a huge commitment to the Great Lakes by Michigan Tech. And I was invited up to help start uh, start that, uh, that whole operation and I'm proud to be here and it's a great opportunity. So welcome everyone. All right, thanks Dr. Meadows. Um, and you know what, actually you are our first presenter today and that's probably what I should have introduced you. So I wanna go over to Jared really quick. Jared, did you wanna say anything else before we uh, turn it over to Dr. Meadows? No, well, I think he did a great job of introducing himself. So I, I think that's <laughs> completely fine. But I, I you know, um, I first saw Dr. Meadows present, I was actually in a, a legislative committee and um, um, learned an absolute ton and one of the things when we talk about all these broad spectrum spectrum issues is we just we don't get an opportunity to learn like why we're doing the things that we do and so um that's essentially why we asked them is to provide a little more breadth as to what's really happening on the shoreline and why and um why we're doing the best we can to try to manage it so all right thanks so uh, just to let everybody know, uh, so Dr. Meadows is gonna do a presentation and after him, uh, Charlie Simon's gonna come up from US Army Corps of Engineers and then Jared's gonna come back and do a presentation on uh, Eagle permitting. Uh, if you joined us a little bit late here, just to remind you that you're all muted. If you have a question, you can type it into the question drop down uh, box that you have on your GoToWebinar toolbar. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Meadows. We should see something pop up on your screen there. All right, we got you. 
Great. Well, as I said, it's a it's an absolute pleasure to to be here with you all this evening, and we're here to answer lots of questions. So, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk about nearshore processes from 1987 to the present, and why 1987 is that was the year uh, after our most recent extreme water level in 1986 throughout most of the Great Lakes. Um, at that time. Uh, Eagle and its predecessors uh, started the Coastal Management Program for the state, and they began to fund research on how the shoreline has changed. And it was an excellent opportunity right after a high water event to, to look at how the shoreline uh, reconfigured itself over the next uh, 40 years or so. So our work with the Coastal Management Program uh, of Eagle is is continuing, and we're doing some some things that we hope are are beneficial to understanding how how the processes, the natural processes, work along the shoreline. My slides won't advance. You might have to click on the actual slide there itself um, outside of the GoToWebinar toolbar. Uh, thank you. There you go. Good. Yep. Great Lakes uh, achieved their current elevation and configuration between about 6,000 and 4,000 years ago. So they're relatively new features, geologically speaking. What that means for us is that they are very, very deep, as we all know, but the sides are, are very steep. There is what we call, because of that, a background erosion that continues throughout the Great Lakes, independent of human influences. And that for Lake Michigan and most of Lake Huron is somewhere around uh, one foot per year. So independent of what we do to impact the nearshore zone, there still is an ongoing, fairly rapid, at least in geologic standards, of, of one foot a year of widening of the Great Lakes and filling in their deep basins. That represents a loss of nearshore sediment to the, to the nearshore zone, which is really um, a natural resource that, that needs to be protected. Water levels, as high as they are now, are extremely important in the whole process because they are an enabler of sediment transport. The real sediment transport is driven by waves. And I will talk in a minute about how water levels and wave energies are related. But as our water levels rise, wave energies rise also. So if we look here at this map of the directions of, of net nearshore transport of sediment, this is driven primarily by the breaking of waves in the expending of the wave energy into the nearshore zone. And a good portion of that energy goes into transporting sediment down the shoreline, parallel to shore. If we look at the southern basin of Lake Michigan, we notice that the sediment transport is southward along both sides, along the Wisconsin coast and along the Michigan coast. And there's a large convergence in Indiana. So, the reason for that is we get further and further south in Lake Michigan, the open water distance to the north, the fetch, uh, becomes larger and larger, and hence the waves become larger and larger. So the net motion of sediment as we get down to, this, to the southern end, the Michigan-Indiana border, is somewhere in excess of 100,000 cubic yards per year of sediment moving continually to the south. So when we're looking for our sand, Indiana has a good portion of it. Similarly, as we move to the north end of the lake, um, the opposite happens. The fetch increases to the south, and it's the waves from the southwest that drive shoreline sediments to the north from about uh, uh, Little Savo Point direct uh, further north. And again, that increases, but you notice the arrows are not nearly as large as they are in Southern Lake Michigan. That's because there's less available sand as we move further north and we start to get into more rocky terrain. This is 
a graph of approximately the last 40 or so years of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron water levels. On the far left-hand side of the graph is 1986, our last major catastrophic high water event. Um, then we see water level fluctuates kind of around the average. And then in the late 1990s, we had another couple of events of nearly as high water levels. But then in 1999, water levels precipitously dropped in Lake Michigan and Huron, and they remained low for about 14 years up to 2013, where they began to rise again very rapidly. So the orange color in, in the graph there is that 14 year period of relatively low Great Lakes water levels, which you'll see shortly gave the beach a chance to recover from the catastrophic damage done in 1986, high water in 1987. Since that water has continued to rise and over on the far right of the graph brings us right up through today, um, where we are almost to the level of the 1986 highs for Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And the latest Corps of Engineers forecasts are that we will exceed that by probably four or five inches. So, so things look very serious for at least another year in terms of water levels. This is a, a graph that we constructed after the 1986 high water years. It starts in 1958 and goes to about 1990. It is a graph of both water levels in the solid line and wave energies in the dashed line. And I'll add some uh, graphics here to, to help that be a little more visible. So what we notice is as water levels rise, so do wave energies. And that makes sense because the storms that bring our water to the Great Lakes uh, and during this time of year, during the winter storms, that's both moisture that is drawn into the atmosphere off the Pacific Ocean and off the Gulf of Mexico. And you've probably noticed we've had some very large storms in recent history where you can see in the weather maps that moisture being dragged from either of those ocean basins up to the Great Lakes. And when it's dumped in the Great Lakes, um, not only does it bring water, but it also brings wind. And that's why the wave energy tracks with water levels so nicely. But what happens is the wind is instant. As the storms are happening, the wind is there. And in the, the stronger the wind, the larger the waves. And we've seen some tremendous waves over the last several years. So the same process is, is happening again. Uh, the water takes a while, about 18 months, to all work its way into the basins of the Great Lakes. So the, the wave energy rises before the water levels. Um, but, but the water levels are the enabler that allow the wave energies to change where they work on the beach. And as we all know, uh, right now, water levels are sufficiently high that the waves are able to work right at the base. There is very little exposed beach remaining um, to, to act as a buffer of those waves. So the impact on the shoreline, which is the bar graphs across the bottom, is catastrophic. And in both of these most recent events, you'll notice that the maximum shoreline damage occurred in the peak in wave energy and not necessarily during the peak in water levels. So it really is the waves that are the culprit in terms of causing the devastation. And as I said earlier, the water, water levels being high enable those waves to work at the most dangerous place to the shoreline. So the shoreline takes a double hit in the conditions that we are under right now. The water levels are high, which allow the waves to work right at the base of the dunes and bluffs uh, causing catastrophic loss. You'll notice that from low water level years to, to high water level years, wave energy actually increases by about 25%. So if it seems like the waves are bigger and more frequent, than they are, have been in the past, that is absolutely correct. Well, how does that all work with a natural beach? So the top diagram shows 
the beach that we had during that 14 years of low water level, um, the exposed part of the beach above the low water level uh, indicator there on the right builds uh, secondary berms, the dune crests are well vegetated, the beach is, is very fat and broad uh, at that point. As water level rises, though, we move to the, to the lower diagram. The beach, in order to come into equilibrium with the change in both water level and the change in wave energy, gives up some of that visible beach. It, it allows itself to erode, and it piles that, that eroded sand offshore in sandbars. So the beach itself readjusts to both water level and wave energies to be in the most dissipative sh shape it can be to those incoming waves. And it does that by building those offshore bars. And I'm sure many of you have seen how that trips the big storm waves once, twice, maybe three times before, before those waves actually reach the shoreline. So that's nature's way of protecting the shore is to have a beach that is natural and free to be able to readjust to the changing conditions. If you notice, this, this graph also says summer and winter beach. During the summer, we tend to have much more lower energy, mellow waves uh, striking our shoreline, which actually tend to build the beach back up. Uh, similarly, in the winter, we get our bigger storms, more violent waves, and the beach then gives up some of its uh, of, of its uh, above water presence to form those protective bars out in deeper water. So this process goes back and forth, both on decadal scales, tens of years, as well as on seasonal scales. Since we're undergoing such devastation on our shorelines presently, again, under EGO funding, we have created what we call the 80 year look at the shoreline. So we have gone back and rectified the early photographs from 1938, uh, several steps in between to the present. This most uh, um, recent photographs that, that are of this high quality uh, are in 2016. Um, three year, two years ago, we did all of the Lake Michigan shoreline, which you're seeing a section of on this particular view graph, uh, all, all of the lower peninsula, and as you can see, down to the individual property owner level. Last year, we did the same for Lake Huron, and this year, we are starting on Lake Superior, again, all under funding from Eagle. The blue line on the right-hand uh, aerial view of this section of southern Lake Michigan shoreline, the blue line is the 1938 shoreline. And the second more landward blue line is the 2016 shoreline. Similarly, the orange lines are the top of the bluff. The 1938 top of the bluff is the one out in the water. And the 2016 top of the bluff is the orange line uh, slightly inland from the water's edge. So over that 80 years, we can calculate the rate of change of shoreline and the rate of retreat of the bluff. Um, the red hashed marks on the far right-hand side are at that same rate where we believe the edge of the bluff will be 30 years from today. So again, it's, uh, there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure along our shorelines uh, that is vulnerable. So the goal of this is to provide individual uh, coastal communities, individual property owners, coastal planners, uh, an opportunity to see exactly how things have changed over a very long period of time. Um, this website is available to the general public. The website is across the bottom there, geospatialresearchmtu.edu slash coastal zone management program there. These this slides will be available if you can't copy that down. Uh, and if all uh, 1,200 of you go on our site at the same time, you will definitely crash it for us. But we, we encourage everyone to, uh, to use the site. And keep in mind, it's a work in progress, and your comments are most welcome. Armoring the shoreline is not a permanent solution. Um, you can see in the 
In the view graph, this is the same section of shoreline that we just looked at. This is an oblique view uh, taken from small aircraft. Uh, those views are available on the website as well. You can see the remnants of the of previous shore protection structures that have failed. Yes, weaker than the one that's in place now, but that's the general progression is a is a weak shore protection is built and then it fails and a bigger one is built and it fails and a bigger one is built and it fails. Uh, to the upper right hand corner, you see uh, a section of revetment uh, and the impact it has on an unprotected adjoining piece of property. So hard engineering structures can produce adverse effects uh, on down the shoreline. Groins are a typical, quote, hardened shore protection structure. Um, their sole purpose is to trap sand on the updrift side at the expense of shore of the shoreline to the downdrift side. So to the left of this, the shoreline is suffering as a result of the sediment being collected here on the updrift side. That generally forces the next neighbor to do a similar groin, which forces the next neighbor to do a similar groin. And the process continues down, down the shoreline. So these structures, although can be helpful to the individual property owner, can have very adverse effects uh, down the shoreline. Harbor structures, uh, whether they're large structures like the uh, St. Joe Benton Harbor structure or smaller recreational boat structures like New Buffalo um, are essentially large groins. They are again trap shore uh, near shore sediments on the updrift side, which is to the north on both of these structures uh, at, at the harm of the downdrift shorelines. And you can see there is no beaches on these downdrift shorelines. It's all been stopped. The other feature of the harbor structures is they stick sufficiently far out that they can direct sediment offshore to the point where it is lost from the nearshore environment. Once the sediment reaches what we call the depth of closure, which is somewhere around 20 to 25 feet for, for most of our shorelines that we're looking at, uh, that sediment deeper than that, if it's transported deeper than that, it's lost forever to the beaches. It, the waves cannot uh, produce sufficient energy to bring that back to the beaches. So um, again, uh, trapping of, of sediment by either private or uh, commercial structures uh, is, is a detriment to long reaching property uh, on the downdrift side. The larger the structure, the greater the area of impact. Shore parallel structures, revetments are, are one of those, seawalls are another. Um, again, have potential to do damage to downdrift properties. You can see on the left hand side, a revetment that, that is extended quite a way, has a grain field uh, within it. Um, and the property as we go to the south is greater and greater impact. On the right hand side, you see a natural beach and how it's able to adjust the variations in water level. And then to the south side of that, again, revetments trying to protect the private property. So the effect that revetments have are cartooned here. Um, if we look at the uh, upper, upper diagram, if whether it's a natural rock shoreline or whether it's a, a human induced uh, revetment, the, when the waves strike a very steep structure such as these, and it has a very steep slope compared to a natural beach, waves actually are reflected in the offshore. And as those waves are reflected, they interact with the incoming waves, which creates greater turbulence near shore. And that scours the sand away to, to, to deposit it in offshore sandbars, as you see in the uh, lower of the upper two diagrams. Um, same concept is being deployed, deployed in the uh, lower diagram where the connotation is seawalls are often put in as a last ditch effort to pre prevent erosion. 
So if you're to the point where your property needs a this to, to survive, you you are in serious jeopardy. This is an example of a revetment in the center of the picture, um, very steep seawall type of, of structure. You can actually see in the offshore the crescentric waves that have hit this vertic nearly vertical structure and are reflected back offshore. So obviously the beach is a very low slope. These structures are very high sloping. The goal, if, if you're making revetments, again, needs to have very low slopes in order to minimize that offshore reflection of waves and the pushing of the sand out and away from the shoreline. This is a photograph in the upper right hand corner of Tawas Point on Lake Huron uh, and what it looked like many years ago. Um, it's entitled cumulative impact because when a large section of shoreline becomes revetted um, or composed of groin fields, it has a cumulative impact, impact that lasts, uh, persists for a long time and, and moves down the shoreline. The lower picture of Kyle West Point, you can see what a loss of sand has occurred. And the reason for that is the armoring that occurred during high waters in the 1980s, um, all along the, the, the base of Tawas Point. And you can see in the lower most diagram that the sandbars have been driven quite a distance offshore and there's nothing but deep water between that sandbar and the shoreline. And if I draw your attention over to the right hand side, uh, in the upper right hand corner of that diagram, that same notch in the shoreline is present. You can see that the sandbars are driven away from the shoreline, depleting the shoreline of a source of, of sediment and the sand is simply bypassing what was Talos Point and moving on around and filling in in the bay. So it's the cumulative effect of many miles of revetment along that shoreline has driven the sand away from the end of Talos Point. Some history, um, again, with Eagle funding right after the high water of 1986, um, they asked us to create uh, 45 permanent survey sites, uh, 31 of those along Lake Michigan, the rest in Lake Huron and areas that were particularly sensitive to coastal erosion. We surveyed those sites from the top of the dunes or bluffs out to 30 feet of water depth at least once a year for the 20 years between 1988 and 2008, um, sometimes uh, multiple times per year. So. You know how I spent my summers and uh, we learned a good deal uh, as a result of this of how beaches recover from extreme water levels and what we think how beaches are going to recover after this high water episode is, is, is completed. In addition to the surveys, we, we took extensive photographs of the shoreline. This is survey line one, which is at the Michigan-Indiana border. Um, you can see in 1988, the survey crew is there on the beach. The beach is all carved out. There's been erosion of, of the bluff up to the, to the road. Um, you can see that the, the road commission has thrown large limestone boulders uh, over the bank to try and, and preserve the road up on top. And you can see a stormwater drain uh, right above the heads of the shore crew, survey crew sticking out 20 or 30 feet out essentially into midair. During starting a call from, from looking at that water level chart that starting in 1999, water levels dropped precipitously and remained low for 14 years up until about 2013. Our last survey was in 2008 of those 45 lines because the beach had built back to such an extent, there was no longer a threat and no longer a need to continue those 20 years of coastal surveys. So this is that same beach uh, about halfway through that beach building process that went on for 14 years. And up in the upper right hand corner, you can see the very end of that storm drain pipe that was 30 feet out into midair has been totally um, 
totally encased in sand that has been driven close to the shore by waves and then blowing up across the beach. So one of the take home lessons here is to make sure as the water level falls, you're doing everything you can to stabilize uh, that beach and to help help it in every way to rebuild its natural armoring um, for the next event of high water. Since those were actual surveys, I have a very complicated graph here to show you how that beach has recovered. And I'll break that down here into uh, sections that I think are more visual. This is what the beach looked like in 1988, right after high water in, in 1986. So the ordinary high water mark is the division line between uh, the state's jurisdiction below that and the federal jurisdiction um, to regulate what goes on and the property owners uh, right and the public trust doctrine right to, to exercise access to the beach. So in 1988, that uh, ordinary high water mark intersected the profile very close to the edge of the bluff. Um, as we move forward in time, you can see that the beach has started to rebuild itself by 1997. Um, and uh, a fore dune is starting to, to develop and to stabilize. 1998, recall again, was another intermediate episode of high water. And what did the beach do? It did just exactly what it was supposed to do. It gave up part of the subaerial beach, um, the part we walk on, and produced an offshore sandbar to, again, to be as dissipative as possible to those incoming waves, the change in wave energy, and the change in water level. Well, the recovery continued. Here's 2000. And finally, our last survey in 2008, a tremendous change in the beach. So the beach grew horizontally 250 feet from where it was in the first survey in 1988, and it grew vertically. Those numbers on the left-hand side are elevations in feet. It grew about 18 feet vertically. So a tremendous amount of sand uh, recovered in that beach during during that time. And again, here's a little refresher on where it was at each of those steps along the way. So the beach does come back, but it never comes back as far as, as it never comes all the way back, another way to say that. So in that next round of high water that we're on now, the erosion will be greater than it was in the last round of high water. We're always taking two steps back and one step forward. So this is that same section of beach in 2018. There is a new home there uh, under construction. The construction is ongoing at the time this picture was taken. You notice the yellow circle in the center. Those are the same limestone built boulders that were placed there in 1987 for our first survey. They are starting to reemerge from underneath that 18 feet of sand that accumulated in the back beach area. Here's that house a year later, 2019. Construction is completed and now there's a revetment out front on the Lakeport side. And here's that house this year in 2020. Um, the house and the revetment now are acting like a groin and greatly impacting the uh, downdrift property. The road that that uh, diagonals off is the Michigan-Indiana border. So the home behind the house on the waterfront is actually in Indiana. There are a number of alternatives to hardened structures and we have the experts with us here tonight to be able to to address those things, but there is, I would like to draw your attention to uh, the website at the bottom, the Cape Cod Coastal Planner. Um, these images are from that website. Um, it's a tremendous uh, resource. And if you go to that site and click on each of these particular alternatives, they talk about its benefits and its shortcomings and what types of areas they're most most successful in using. It's a very well-organized website. So 
vegetating the shoreline, restoring the dunes, stabilizing the, the banks in the dunes, establishing districts of, of critical planning concern, um, setting aside pieces that are just not appropriate for, for development, restricting the flow of groundwater are all soft solutions that can help in the future. Uh, there's not much that's going to help during this tremendous episode of high water and high waves that we're experiencing now. But again, to, to recover from that and prepare for the next one, these are very good things to be doing. Um, there are also more aggressive soft solutions, including sand bypassing, which is taking sand from behind traps like the, the updrift side of, of harbor structures and doing the work that nature would have done, and that is placing it on the downdrift side so that it can re-nourish those beaches. There's also artificial beach nourishment that many states uh, strongly uh, endorse, um, and many of the Florida beaches are maintained by, by beach nourishment. It's sacrificial. The, the beach nourishment will not last uh, very long, and it sometimes lasts very short periods of time, but again, it preserves the natural ability of the beach to readjust itself um, as, as, uh, as water levels and wave energy change. Stormwater management to make sure you don't induce bluff failure is, is important. Managed realignment, elevating structures so they're easier to move, and then actually managed relocation in the lower right hand side, which is moving homes. And again, we have we have experts here to answer your questions on that. So thank you very much for your interest, and we'll be around to answer questions after this is over. All right. Thanks, Dr. Meadows. Uh, interesting stuff there. Um, just want to, before we go on to our next presenter, just want to remind everyone that um, if you have questions, you can type them into that question box you have. And we are getting quite a few questions as they come in now, so we'll be addressing those after our presentations. Um, our next presenter is Charlie Simon. So, Charlie, uh, I'm going to transfer it over to you, and I will let you introduce yourself. Okay, uh, good afternoon again. My name is Charlie Simon. Uh, I am chief of the regulatory office uh, for Detroit District, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I've been around the regulatory program for a long time in various capacities. Uh, I used to work out of the Grand Haven office. I uh, worked in the district office. Um, I've got to see a lot of the state. Uh, that's been a good thing. Um, this, af uh, this afternoon, this evening, I'm going to uh, take you kind of through a very abbreviated very shortened version of um, some of the outreach materials that regulatory staff uh, kind of regularly present around the state. Uh, we've typically done a couple of uh, outreach presentations every year around different parts of the state. Um, so I'm going to give you a very abbreviated uh, version of that. Um, we did actually have plans for a couple of outreach events this year. Um, Obviously, those in-person events are, are um, we're probably going to try to transition those to some kind of virtual event like this. So um, if you're interested, can I keep an eye on our website um, and look for those. Okay, if I can get my slideshow working here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so. There's kind of two basic um, main statutory authorities that the Corps works under and the regulatory program. Uh, the first of these is Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act, 1899, very old law. Um, the Rivers and Harbors Act um, allows us to regulate structures and work in navigable waters in the United States. Um, this includes um, <clears throat> basically in anything in, on, over, or under navigable waters. Uh, includes dredging, plates of, of material, um, regulated structures, seasonal, temporary, or permanent. Um, second authority is Clean Water Act, a much newer statute, and under which the Corps regulates the discharge of dredge or fill material into waters in the United States 
including wetlands. The MDQ the Eagle is actually um, now using their online, they fully transitioned to their online MyWaters uh, system for applications. So the Eagle and the Corps have a joint permit application, which can be used for basically any permit request. Um, although it's one application, uh, each agency kind of conducts its own review, its own separate review, goes through its own process, and comes to an independent decision. Uh, in most cases, you will require a permit both from the MDEQ and from the Corps before starting work. Um, we're always glad to talk to people before they get to the permit application stage. So, um, and we certainly recommend that if people have questions. In terms of types of review, um, there's various types of review processes that the Corps uses to evaluate projects. When applications come into the Corps, uh, that's the first step that we do is we look at it and, and determine what kind of review process is this going to require on our part. Um, the review process is, is different for different types of permit types. Um, the types of, of permit uh, people's projects might qualify for kind of depends upon the type of project, you know, how much work people are doing, the extent to nature, the impacts uh, to waterways and wetlands. Uh, general permits, there's a couple different types of those, nationwide and regional permits. Um, they authorize certain categories of activities. Uh, such as docks, seawalls, maintenance work, many shore protection projects, uh, which meet certain criteria. Um, those general permits, they have been reviewed in advance, kind of an, an authorized kind of in a blanket way in advance, and that those, those um, authorizations kind of have set out the terms and conditions for those permits. So what we do, we get a, a review under a general permit is we verify that people's project kind of meets those terms and, con and conditions, and we verify that with a letter to them. Uh, the evaluation for those is much um, simpler and faster for those kinds of types of actions. Um, you know, we encourage people to take advantage of that, uh, particularly, you know, um, if, they're, if they have some constraints in terms of time. If they can meet a general permit, they're generally going to get a response much, much more quickly. For projects that don't qualify for general permits, uh, they will be evaluated under one of the two different types of individual permits, either a letter of permission or a standard permit. Uh, letter permit, we do just kind of abbreviated coordination. Standard permit kind of gets the full blown review. We put out a public notice. Um, we do eventually do a, an environmental assessment and make a decision. Okay, as I mentioned before, we're, we're happy to meet with people beforehand. Uh, usually that's in the form of a pre-application meeting. Uh, once we get people's application, um, <clears throat> we determine what kind of action we're gonna review it under. Um, we go through that evaluation, coordination, whatever that is. Um, and then ultimately that ends in, in the course decision. I'll just focus here on one, a uh, particular kind of nationwide permit, uh, which is nationwide permit 13. Um, since we're talking about shoreline, shoreline processes and high water, um, there are a lot of the requests that we're seeing these days is for some type of shore protection, as you might imagine. Uh, nationwide permit 13 is, is typically used to authorize that kind of shore protection. It can authorize riprap, revetments, other bank stabilization projects uh, that have been determined to have minimal impacts. Some of the key conditions are listed here. Um, those included include, you know, um, no more than 500 feet, no more than one cubic yard per linear foot, and um, no fill in wetlands. Uh, those conditions, the core does have the the option to waive those limits um, if we do additional coordination. So that coordination. With other agencies, typically adds you know, another couple of weeks, two to three weeks, uh, to our review process, and we consider the com any comments that we get uh, when we make a determination on that nationwide permit. The 
just a kind of a picture in a uh, window into what the Corps has been doing recently. Um, based on the federal fiscal year, which starts in October, so in the last six months, um, our workload for incoming actions has been uh, just over 2,400 incoming actions. Our average workload for that period is just over 1,000. So we are running well over double our normal number of actions that we would evaluate um, during the past six months. Uh, despite kind of the, the substantial increase in workload, we have uh, tried to maintain uh, uh, responsiveness to the public, uh, particularly for those people trying to do some kind of shore protection. Uh, we generally have, have tried to triage the applications that's coming in, coming that are coming in to try to identify the ones that are critical need. Um, a third of the general permits that we've received, we have completed them within seven days of when we get a complete application. Uh, overall, our goal for general permits is that uh, we we complete them in 60 days. So we have completed 80, 86% of the GPs um, within the last six, six months um, within that 60 day time frame. Uh, just kind of a snapshot here of water levels for the core. Uh, just kind of echoing a little bit uh, what Dr. Meadows, Meadows was talking about. You know, I just picked up the the um, the chart for Lake Michigan here on, and the projections there are that water levels for Lake Michigan here on, which they kind of consider one basin because they are connected completely connected at the Straits of Mackinac. So water levels for Lake Michigan and Huron is projected to be above the average high water levels um, for the next several months. So um, you can see the on the chart kind of the dashed green line that is the the projected level and then the the red bars around that that is kind of the range of their projection. You know, which depends upon largely upon precipitation coming into the basin. And the slide that I've just thrown up uh, just shows where our field offices are around the state. We've got five field offices around the state plus the office in, in uh, Detroit. Um, you're welcome to contact any of our staff members. Um, we're, we're happy to talk to you. Um, and lastly, I've attached just uh, several contact points and the Corps website. And if you want to type in the long one, you'll get the full regulatory website. Um, the email address at the bottom. Um, if you have general questions, if you feel like you want to submit something to us, um, that's the way to do it. And our general Phone number, 800 number is, is right at the tail end there. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it off now. Thanks. All right, thanks, Charlie, for your presentation. Um, I am going to now move it over or move it back to Jared Sanders from Eagle. So Jared, you there still? I am, Jim. Great. Uh, so we're all set. You guys see me okay? Yep, we got you. Great. Um, let's move through my slides here. So again, I mentioned that we had a the last time we did one of these was a lot more broad spectrum. So I just want to review some of the things we talked about last time. Going to not get into wide details. You um, just heard a couple of presenters talk about. Um, the Great Lakes are all projected to be high again this year, in particular Michigan and Huron, um, expected to be a little bit worse than they were uh, last year in terms of water levels. Um, this is being caused by essentially unprecedented amounts of precipitation in the last five years, and we can't manage our way out of it with the few water level controls that we have. Um, impacts are really being felt all over the state. 
Um, and then we do have a high water action team that includes federal, state, uh, and local partners, and we're working together to do the best we can from a government perspective to address the crisis. Um, so I am going to try to burn through this quickly because I want to get to questions and we have a ton of expertise in our panelists, but I'm going to maybe head off a few of the common questions that come in. Um, so first, is there any financial help for homeowners out there? Um, the, at the state and federal level, there is not. I don't think there's much at the local level either. There is some rumbling both at the federal level and state level um about some funding help but largely geared towards local units of government as they're dealing with these um, issues and so ultimately it falls on the landowners um, if you're a private business homeowner cottage what have you so do i need a permit the answer to that is if you're asking that question you probably do there's three state statutes on the great lakes shoreline that permits are issued under the Great Lakes bottomlands is really all coastal uh, areas, and um, there's a you know a need for a permit um, if you're below a certain water level, or now with the water level high where it's at, if on a still day you're going to do any disturbance um, that would touch the the water level where it's at today. Um, the other two are very very uh, regional; they're defined areas of high risk erosion and critical dunes. Um, most of you, if you're on here, probably know if you're in one of those areas. If you don't, you can go to the website I'll show in a little while and figure out if that uh, applies to you. It still is just one permit application. It's just the standards change a little bit in terms of permitting. Um, what if I don't get a permit? What if I just go ahead and do the work? Uh, we're certainly aware that there is a lot of that going on out there. Certainly, there is a lot of that happening. Um, if you do that, you're you're breaking a state law, federal law, um, and you know we're not necessarily in a mode where we want to fine a bunch of homeowners. Um, but I I think the the biggest risk that you're taking is if you just go ahead and do the work and you don't work through the permitting process. Um, the biggest risk as a homeowner you're probably taking is the fact that at some point everything that's out there is going to either have to come on. Uh, under a permit or be changed so it can be permitted or um, or going to have to come out. And so our focus has been on trying to help the people that are doing it, it correctly. We are pushing back on contractors that are doing unpermitted work and we probably won't get out of this without finding a contractor. But as a homeowner, you don't want to sink a bunch of money into a solution that turns out later to not be permittable. Uh, and then incur the cost of having to correct it. So that leads to the next question is how, how long is it gonna take to get a permit? We are prioritizing permitting um, based on risk to homes, critical infrastructure and human health and safety. So the more critical that risk is, we're bumping those up the line. We're expediting everything and so um, in fact, we're, we've issued about a thousand permits in the last six months, uh, and uh, um, eighty percent of those have fifteen days or less of processing time. But the most critical ones, in some cases, we're issuing those. You know, if the home is really, really at risk, we're issuing those. Sometimes even the same day it comes in or the next day. Um, again, we're following that prioritization schedule. And then for the really the most critical or severe issues, we're working with people if they contact us, in some cases we're saying, yep, okay, the home's about ready to go, you're about ready to lose it, you need to go do something today. Um, go do that, we'll take an after the fact application, we'll guide you or guide your contractor to try to put in something that is permittable. Um, and then we'll take an application for it afterwards. I know the Corps is doing that in certain situations and Charlie mentioned they're expediting things as well. And so I really wanna credit our staff here. They have been unbelievable. It's a limited number of FTEs that we have in this program. They've not been in some influx of money. We've diverted resources out there, but this is largely our, our staff working very hard to make this happen. And then what are your options? And so um, we uh, have a, a home mover expert on today. And so hopefully we can hear a little bit more about that. 
but um, you heard Dr. Meadows talk about there are consequences when we do hard armoring and permanent structures on the lake, and those consequences slowly are going to change our our lake shore for the worse. So um, if you have an opportunity to move your house or use some of the soft armoring uh, techniques um, that Brian can talk about too, um, then that's the best option for the Great Lakes. And, uh, frankly, it could, in certain circumstances, save you some money. So move your house, move the road, um, in some cases less expensive. And if you have the room and have the opportunity to do it, that's the best option. And also when we do permitting, part of that is an alternatives uh, analysis or considering alternatives. And so in some cases we may come back if you ask for revetment and say, why can't you move your home if you again if you have the reasonable opportunity to do that so that's really the first priority as this is happening this has happened before on the great lakes um, and it's going to happen again and so that is a solution that can allow you to protect your home and um and uh and also not have you know the negative consequences that come with armoring um we don't have that opportunity if you have to go to some type of a structure uh, we prefer that people start with thinking about riprap or stone revetment, large stones um, along the lakeshore. There's good construction practices. Again, we want it built into the existing shoreline um, in the shoreline profile uh, so that it's not sticking out in the lake in areas that are, isn't already. Um, we'd like it built into sort of the existing slope. Um, at times there are access challenges you can see, and if you imagine a high bank beach, there are challenges associated with any of these, these things. But um, that's where we'd like you to, if you have to do revetment to protect your home, and we're committed to making sure that everyone has an opportunity to protect their home, uh, if that's what you have to do, we'd like you to start there thinking about that as an option. So some of the other things that people ask about, maybe Brian, uh, when he gets a chance to get on the mic and talk about some of those bioengineering or soft solutions that are out there using natural materials and trying to maintain natural beach processes, um, temporary sandbags and geotubes, and there's a bunch of other names. So these are essentially geotextile fabric um, filled with sand. There is a minor project category for this. There's a minor project category for riprap, which is a less expensive and a little easier permit to get. But I really wanna emphasize temporary here. Um, these are not a long-term solution. Uh, in some ways, if this is your long-term plan, um, you're gambling a little bit that those are gonna hold up long enough until the water um, recedes. And they are less expensive, that's for sure, but um, there's really only a couple areas of the state where these where there's a ton of use of sandbags. I think personally, we were very fortunate this winter that we did not get a hard freeze and ice heave um, because I, I'm not sure they would stand up to that. So, um, and it's we're talking about a really inhospitable environment when we're putting these things in. And so, again, uh, some people if you don't have the resources. This is something that may be able to help, but you should really view it as a temporary solution. And they all have to come out if you're putting them in part of applying for that minor uh minor project category is an agreement that they're going to come out eventually too um steel sea walls uh again this is an alternatives thing so we would prefer that you use stone revetment if you can there are some applications where steel steel seawall is really the only option to save the house for the most part we're going to have you put stone out in front of it anyways um, but sometimes you need that structural uh, support. So that'll be on you as the applicant to sort of prove why you need a seawall rather than something that has a little, that we believe has less impact like riprap. And then offshore structures, uh, which Dr. Meadows talked a lot about, um, those will be pretty difficult to permit new like offshore structures, whether it's a wave break, a jetty or a groin any of those things. Again, it's an alternative thing. So we believe that that riprap or stone revetment is less impactful. Uh, we know it has impacts, but less impactful than some of the other alternatives that are out there. And then there's a whole bunch of other ideas out there. And you know, we're very careful to say, we, we don't say, we can't permit something. 
Um, there are, these are very site specific. And so there, some of these other solutions may have a benefit, but again, it's gonna be you on the applicant to sort of demonstrate why uh, this is going to have less impact or why it's absolutely necessary um, to do it. So some things to know, uh, our priorities are protecting homes and minimizing impact. And I should say protecting homes and critical infrastructure. So we're trying to balance those two things. I mentioned the site the site specific in terms of what's the right thing. And then when you're applying, we typically are not gonna permit you to reclaim land. So again, this is about stopping the erosion where it's at and saving the home, saving the critical infrastructure. Um, we're not gonna permit you to necessarily, uh, or very seldomly are gonna permit you to reclaim yard or something like that because it was lost. Dr. Meadows talked about how the beach will rebuild itself um, when the water recedes. And so, um, you know, we're typically going to be permitting something if we do revetment. And again, we want you to move the house if we can, but if we do revetment, we'll be permitting it where that erosion line is. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't quickly at least mention the uh, stay home, stay safe order. Uh, the the one that came out uh, last week um, that uh, superseded uh, Executive Order 202042. Um, we have heard in some areas that they're this is really so Eagle is not the purveyor of this. This is a law enforcement issue, um, but we have heard that there have been some holdups. Um, but the frequently asked questions document, and again, you can go to the website and read it yourself. If you're a contractor, this is ultimately on you to make the decision um, and about whether you meet uh, the definitions of what's allowable. If you go to the frequently asked questions, again, this is similar to the last order. There is language where it specifically contemplates that certain types of construction are allowable or permissible including things to protect and improve um, critical infrastructure, as well as, uh, I can just read it, uh, undertake projects that are necessary to maintain safety, sanitation, and essential operations of a residence. So, but non-emergency improvements uh, to residences are not permitted. And so the times when I've heard about this, there was some question about whether or not it's an emergency, right? So emergency means I have to do this to save my home or to save this critical infrastructure. And that is very site specific and that's on the contractors uh, or homeowners to make that call. If you're going to do the work, you have to follow the safety, the standard safety precautions, social distancing, um, but it's up to you to review that. So um, so what should you do? Uh, I, we Both Charlie and I mentioned that we are expediting permits and we're going as quickly as we can and we're moving a ton of work out, but the contractors are in high demand um, and as well as we have a ton of work to do. And so if, you, if your home is threatened, get started on it right now. That might be moving your house. It might be doing something that's more soft armoring or it might be that you need a revetment. It, the time to get started is now find an experienced professional that does the work that you're talking about, someone who's done that type of work before and knows. Again, it's a very difficult place to build structures or to move houses is not, uh, that's a very specialized um, skill in business. If you're not sure how to get started, uh, you can go to michigan.gov forward slash Eagle High Water, um, the, or you can go to michigan.gov forward slash High Water, uh, the high water webpage used to be an Eagle page. It's moving to a more statewide page where it'll have more information. So if you're specifically talking about uh, shoreline uh, or dealing with shoreline erosion or permitting and stuff, you go to Eagle forward slash Eagle high water. And if you want to talk to someone, we have an 800 number. We staff that up uh, basically during normal business hours. That's still active even in the COVID crisis. That's 800-662-9278. And just tell the operator you're calling about high water and they'll get you to a permitting staff person to get your questions. So um, I, I appreciate it. And I think we're pretty much ready to you can take it back, Jim, and we can jump into questions here.
Yeah, thanks, Jared. So um, we do have a lot of questions. I'll just let our panelists know that. And um, while we're waiting for questions to, uh, while waiting for me to ask those questions, I'm going to launch a quick poll um, just to help us get a better idea of how many, how many people are watching the webinar as your location. Uh, appreciate you let us know that. And now I'm going to bring it back to me here. Okay, thank you all for ask, answering that question. Um, so really quick, Jared, we have a lot of questions on um, <laughs> kind of the same theme. Uh, basically, if our, and I'll just read this one question because we have a lot of questions very similar. Uh, if artificial structures and rock revetments are detrimental to neighboring properties, if there are options to move structures, why are you approving them? So why does Eagle approve these? So that that is part of the I mean that is part of the decision making criteria is to look at alternatives and so um, there are <clears throat> excuse me there are lots of places um, that's part of the long term planning piece that we need to do work on but there are lots of places where there just simply is not an opportunity to move the house there is not room um, from where it's located now to where the erosion line is that the house uh, cannot be moved and so we are issuing. Um, typically issuing some type of permit there and we're trying to um, we're trying to make sure that what we do issue what is what we view as the least impactful structure again it's trying to balance those two things protecting home <clears throat> excuse me protecting homes and in, uh, homes and critical infrastructure with doing the least amount of damage long term the great lakes is what we can Oops, forgot to unmute my mic. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. Uh, so right on your screen, you see all of our presenters and panelists we have. And I'll let you know that if, uh, several of you, I have forwarded your questions as they come in to some of our panelists already. So I think they've been engaging with you already. Uh, another theme that came up a lot, of, a lot on this, Jared, and maybe you could point out the correct person to answer this, was options for more natural um, remedies or natural processes that uh, people can utilize. And I'm wondering if you or one of the panelists might want to talk about that. Yeah, I think Brian can kick that one off and if there's others that want to jump in, uh, that's great. So go ahead, Brian. Sure, sure, thank you. So uh, one thing uh, that we've talked about a lot is the open coasts. And I think one important distinction to make is that it's not only the open coasts that are affected by high, great, uh, uh, high water levels. We're also talking about our our near shore inland lakes, our drawn river mouths, our river properties. Uh, high, uh, uh, high Great Lakes water levels are affecting properties and shorelines for miles and miles inland. Uh, as we talk about natural alternatives, uh, they're a little bit more limited, uh, as Dr. Meadows mentioned, on the open coast in these places where we might be getting eight and 10 foot waves hitting the shoreline itself. Uh, in some of those cases, uh, uh, you know, strategically placing maybe some of these revetments, uh, as was mentioned, in order to minimize the ecological impact uh, uh, is the best way to go. As we move into our inland lakes where we have two and three and four foot waves maybe hitting some of these properties, those are the places where our natural shoreline alternatives uh, are really much more applicable. And there are a wide variety of ways that we can incorporate those techniques, uh, whether it's re-sloping shorelines, adding especially shrubs along a shoreline we found are incredibly effective. Uh, I would suggest that anybody that's interested in learning more about some of these natural te shoreline techniques specifically, go to the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership website, and that's mishorelinepartnership.org. Uh, we have a lot of information on that website about a lot of these different specific techniques that can be used uh, at, as alternatives to rock revetments or, or uh, steel armoring. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, question came in, I don't know if uh, Dr. Buttles wants to answer this or someone else, but uh, has there ever been any lawsuits from downdrift property owners against the property owners that install groins or other armoring due to loose to loss of sediment moving into their beach fronts 
Yes, there have um, numerous ones, uh, uh, both for homeowner against homeowner on private structures, as well as groups of homeowners um, against the communities or um, against the federal government. All right, thank you. Uh, this is kind of a broad question. I don't know how you guys want to answer this, but I think it's something that a lot of people wanted to hear. Um, we talked a lot about the downsides of what's been going on. Um, how do we help the beach recover? Um, people want to hear a little bit more about that, how we help beach recover. So I don't know if Dr. Meadows, do you want to address that or anybody? Sure, I, I can kick it off and, and welcome uh, my partners here to chime in. Um, as, as water level begins to fall is, is the time to get started. Um, there are natural plants, uh, dune grass that, that work to trap sediment as it's being blown by the wind. Uh, snow fences help with that process, uh, establishing vegetation to stabilize the bluff, um, artificially adding sand, um, again, uh, is, is something that many states do. So that can come from upland sources. Uh, um, and maybe Jared wants to comment, but pr presently it cannot come from, from uh, offshore so sources in the state of Michigan. Um, but, but it is done elsewhere in, in the country. Those types of things tend to be, to be very effective. Um, there's also a whole series, and maybe Brian would want to comment on those on, on nature-assisted uh, types of, of plantings and, and rolled mats that, that uh, decay over time, but in the meantime, they, they tend to uh, trap sediments. So this is Jared. I'll jump real quickly on the comment about the beach nourishment. Um, so uh, we typically are not permitting people to dredge near shore sand. There's been a lot of questions about that with all the sandbags that are filled. Um, and typically the answer to that has been no, because of the importance in near shore sand of preventing erosion. Um, there are, there have been certainly, and Dr. Mills might know the history of this with the state better than I do. I haven't been in this position as long as some people have been working on these issues. But um, my understanding is we've never actually had an application in terms of someone dredging like uh, deep water sand solely for the purposes of bringing it up for beach nourishment. Um, we certainly are uh, willing to entertain that idea. Um, we just need to sort of figure out how it fits into the permitting uh, scheme and uh, um, you know how it fits into the statutes that we have. But the door is certainly not closed on that. The door is is almost closed on dredging of near shore sand because of the when you do that, you're essentially increasing wave energies coming in, and as that gap in sand moves, you're then also impacting your neighboring properties. Yeah, thanks. Does um, Eagle have a preferred revetment method for shoreline water erosion for both high and low bank areas? So either I, I think uh, John or Corey, if you guys want to jump in on that and talk a little bit about the, that decision making. Sure. I can take this it. Is, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, John. Okay, I was going to say, unfortunately, it just it depends quite a bit on the site. We always say that, but it really does. Um, quite often, what we are, you know, requesting people look at first with their engineer, if they have one or their contractor, is look at a large rock revetment that usually holds up in a lot of different scenarios, as far as like your sand dune or your clay bluff or other mixes thereof. Um, it doesn't always maybe. It's maybe not always the correct choice, especially when you run into situations where you have a house in imminent danger that's very close to a large dune or bluff that's actively eroding, sometimes a rock revetment. By the time you built it, it would be sticking so far out in the lake because they've waited such a long time to do something about it. So I think we would probably push people generally towards rock revetment, but understand that that doesn't work everywhere. And we always encourage people to you know, talk to an engineer, talk to a contractor that knows what they're doing and has done this type of work before and start with that. Yeah, so 
going along the line, those lines, John, who, who can I talk to about a specific permit that's issued? Uh, they're putting in rocks today and that's basically what you're talking well, about. Well, <laughs> um, I guess it depends on which county it is, but you'd probably want to start with the uh, district, the Eagle District that it falls into. So if it's in the, you know, in the southern three counties in Michigan, it'd be in my district. Um, if it's up um, four counties, I think, above there, uh, Corey might be able to help you, but we can all help, you know, people with other districts. It's just we won't know the details of what's going on with it. Yeah, and, and Jared, people can call a, our 1-800 number too, right, if they need help? Yeah, for sure. They can call the 800 number. You can go to the website. There's also a map of uh, permitting staff uh, there as well. So there's a lot of different ways to figure it out. Yeah, so in my follow-up email, I'll be sure to include the phone numbers that you can contact to get a hold of those people. Um, here's one. Can, can I have a have the large boulders put on the beach of my? Oops, I just. I basically can someone have my screen just bounced. Uh, basically, somebody wants to know if they can put boulders on the beach of their neighbor's um, beach, but boulders neighbor's beach. Um, so can that? Can people do that? Or is that something? I can take this one. This yeah. is Corey. Um, so if you are applying to place a revetment or rock on somebody else's property, you first and foremost need their written authorization to do so. Um, that's something through the permit application process that when you are completing your JPA, it will prompt you or ask you whether or not there are more individuals or properties that the project extends on to. And so then that is an opportunity for the applicant, contractor, consultant to provide those answers um, in a written form. So there needs to be some sort of formal agreement and authorization for you to conduct work on someone else's property. Okay. Uh, will there be any studies, panels, or support for inland flooding? High river and creek levels are causing issues on my property, and I've had little to no help with federal, state, county, or local levels. Um, and this goes along with a couple other questions on, we're talking about Great Lakes shorelines. Is the permitting process the same with inland lakes? So kind of two different things there, but inland. Yeah, so the, the permitting process is similar. Um, they're not the exact same laws. They're different laws, but they, they follow a sort of a similar decision-making process for us on the inland lakes. Um, and then... The, I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, we, the high water action team, um, this is the first one of sort of the follow up town halls. Um, we intend to have some more topical um, town halls, one of them looking at inland lakes, inland uh, flooding um, as well, um, and a you know, a host of other topics, impacts to recreation. Um, I'm bad. I'm not sorry about my, my, it's escaping me what some of the other ones are right now, but that's, we intend to sort of follow up with some topical uh, webinar similar to this, which is focused on something a little bit different. All right. Thanks, Jared. i uh, got another question here. Actually, this is for Dan, Dan, from, um, Dan Dietz. Uh, so we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, what is a generalized cost for moving houses back? Can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay, um, there's not really a generalized price because every house is built differently. And, you know, I, I wish there was a simple fudge factor where I could say to someone, you know, the, the cost is going to be this much. But we we try to go out and we try to assess the, the environment around the structure and also the way the structure is created. And then we, we come up with a cost for relocating it. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So another... it's, it's a case by case basis. Yeah, okay. Uh, we had another question too about when you know, people move houses. Um, somebody here wanted to point out uh, regarding asbestos, and you know if that's something that house movers take consideration in terms of getting appropriate. Is it treated like a demolition, or how is that treated? Well, that's that's a good question too. I mean, if if we see asbestos, we have it abated. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty clear there. Um, next one. Do lakeside property owners experience a loss of home value when the beach is lost? If so, how much does it generally decrease the value percentage-wise? 
And I don't know if any of you guys have looked into that or have any answer for that one. So I'm, I'm going to uh, phone a friend on that. Um, I did a, a similar panel with Coldwell Banker in Holland at the Civic Center. Oh, I'm going to forget when it was, probably in January sometime. And they had a, a home um, assessor there that talked to this. Um, and, and outside of that, that's probably the best thing I can provide is maybe, I think that that is still on their website. And uh, you can, there's a, it's, it's towards the end of the, it's a fairly long um, one or long video, but um, he does a really nice job of talking about that. But certainly, I mean, certainly there is an impact on, on home values. It just isn't the focus of, you know, I, I don't think um, necessarily anyone on the panel today. Okay, can any of you talk about their comment on a reasonable price range for a 100 foot riprap or boulder revetment? <laughs> I, I can so, try to. Yeah, go, oh, ahead, go ahead. ahead. Okay, uh, I was just going to say, in my experience, uh, you know, we're seeing pricing and I, we don't get too into that stuff but i do hear about it from the engineers and the and the contractors sometimes i'm seeing pricing in my area like van buren alley uh, bering county a thousand two thousand a linear foot for a rock revetment that's going to probably last decades so one built either with an engineer involved or something to that level um three to five ton rocks big rocks and built probably up to 15 feet above low water at least um, so a pretty substantial structure, they cost a lot. Um, but there are contractors out there that are pricing them less than that too. The rock is very expensive. I and mean, then if you're putting in multiple tons of rock, it goes up quickly. I think if uh, any, when I, what I tell people when they ask me that question, I do that, get that question quite a bit from applicants or people looking to do a project. I recommend just like anything that's expensive in life, if you're gonna deal with a contractor, I would recommend getting more than one price. Um, there's multiple contractors out there that do that type of work, at least in my area of the state. Um, so it wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea to get several um, bids or, or cost estimates from a contractor and then evaluate them. This is Brian. I was going to add that I've seen costs probably in the range of somewhere between, say, $500 and $2,000 a linear foot. Uh, and really, a lot of that's very site-specific. Uh, access is huge when it comes to working along the lakeshore, how difficult it is to get in there. And we've also seen the cost of armor stone just about triple over the last year because it's in such high demand. So it's definitely a little bit more expensive to, to do that work now than it would have been a couple of years ago. Hey, Jim, I want to piggyback on something that John mentioned there. I just want to uh, plug something that is on our website on the Michigan.gov forward slash Eagle High Water, all one word. There is a list of contractors, include, including home movers and uh, DM's company on there as well. So there's a list of contractors and locations and contact information. Um, and we're updating that all the time. I want to be really careful to say it's not a recommended list it's a list of contractors that do the work but um so if people are struggling to get started uh you can get to that website and see you know what type of contractors are in your area yeah so we've got uh run up our time here just going to go through a couple more quick questions uh for those that have got a lot of questions want to ask a couple more uh this one again is for dan because we did have quite a few more come in about the house moving i know we did talk about that quite a bit um and that's, you said it's kind of case by case, but can you give them like some general number? Like, is it $10,000, $100,000? Um, Cause I guess people are trying to look at the difference between installing some sort of revetment versus moving a house and what, what you might tell them. It looks like, oh, it looks like Dan might've gone off. Dan, you there? My apologies. I, okay. I muted my phone and I sat there talking to you with my phone muted. Um, <laughs> what we've found is entire projects where, where I'm involved with a project from from starting to move it and disassembling to lifting it up, moving it back, putting a new foundation underneath it, setting it down on the new foundation, removing the old foundation, 
you know, you can say that that's going to be somewhere between 80 and a hundred dollars a square foot. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've seen projects go anywhere from, you know, again, an effort like I was just talking about to where everything is taken care of. It's turnkey. I've seen them go anywhere from $130,000 on upward. Okay. Uh, another question on, on the house moving is, uh, does the house have to have a crawl space or a basement in order to move the house? Yeah. All right. Excuse me. I, I, I want to clarify something. I, I don't know if you have a live caller there. Is, are they asking if it has to be there before we move it? Um, yes. <laughs> she said yes, it does. She She's asking, does it have to be there before you move it? Uh, we can create our own own void for inserting uh, lifting equipment underneath the building. So the fact that it may sit on, on columns or piers or something, uh, may be very close to the ground, is not going to stop us from being able to move the structure back. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so, hey, hey, go ahead. Uh, I don't I don't want to speak for the rest of the panelists, but I, I'm willing to maybe put in an extra, you know, 15 minutes here or something like that if we want to get to more questions. If you're willing to do that, okay, I'm willing to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do though, because we are at the end of our time, I will let everybody know that has to leave, and I totally understand that. We still got about 400 and some people on the line. Um, that if you have to leave, that's fine. We are recording the webinar and we'll post the webinar in its entirety online. I'll probably get it up there by the end of the week and everyone that attended or registered, you'll get a link to that as soon as we have it. And if you do have to take off, just wanna let you know that I'll be setting up some, sending out some follow-up information as well with some additional details um, in addition to the link to the recording. So yeah, Jared, I'll stick on line for a little while longer. Um, we had a question here about um, has has permits been issued for shore savers artificial rocks? How do they verify permittability prior to purchasing this product? Anybody hear those? Uh, I don't know, if John or Corey. Have you guys had any applications? I'm sorry, I was having like technical difficulties could you repeat the question i didn't really catch all of it same please <laughs> yeah uh, someone was talking about shore savers like artificial rocks have you heard about those and how do you verify permit permittability prior to purchasing project and this could be probably any product um how do you verify whether it can be permitted or not i can take that query if you want um sure unless you have some input on it <laughs> i have not heard I of that product um, typically what I deal with people uh, when they're doing looking at some product that we haven't seen before or I at least haven't dealt with before I'm going to ask them you know has it been used before on the Great Lakes and and do you have representative projects that are similar to what you're proposing and then I'll look at them I mean we permit a lot of different things I've seen some interesting ones come through in the last couple of months for sure um, I always remind people if you're looking for something that we have not permitted before or the Army Corps has not permitted before, you know, you're looking at something that's going to take a longer review time because we just don't know how it's going to work out. So have you looked at something that's a little more um, standard, like a rock revetment or a seawall with rock in front of it, something like that? And so far, everyone that's proposed something a little odd has decided that they don't want to deal with it primarily um, because they couldn't get a contractor to even look at it or give them a price, so. Charlie, sure. uh, have you guys seen that uh, product be installed or something similar? Yeah, Jared, I mean, I, I'm not particularly, I'm not familiar with that particular product uh, itself. We have um, reviewed actions for those kind of artificial shore protection uh, type of type of uh, products in other places. I don't recall any recently on the Great Lakes. Um, you know, the way the court considers those is, you know, we're not a proponent or an op opponent of any particular proposal. You know, we're going to review it on its merits and and determine, you know, what are the impacts of this. You know, we're not going to make a judgment about whether that product is effective or not. I mean, that's up to the to the applicant and their contractor and whoever else they want to, you know, get an opinion from. But, so we're going to make a determination about what are the impacts of this and is it 
is it detrimental to the overall public interest? Thanks. Okay. Thanks, all. Uh, are property owners allowed to put in hard revetment without the agreement of their property's neighbors? I can take that. I guess is, if, is the question related to, to somebody needing authorization if they're doing work on their own property? I'm assuming it's their own property. Okay, so you, you, if you're just doing work on your on your own subsequent property, you you do not need authorization from your adjacent neighbors as long as the project is confined to your property boundaries. Um, it, if it is a public notice process, that is an opportunity for your adjacent property owners to potentially weigh in on the project and to provide public comment. Um, but if it's one of our more common simplified reviews through our minor project category, that opportunity is not present for adjacent property owners to weigh in. So I think the, the long answer is no, you, you do not need authorization from your adjacent property owners. Um, but part of the review, review process is going to be to assess, you know, some at least minimize the amount of impacts that are passed on to the adjacent property owner so, as well. All right, uh, we did have a uh, several questions, and this might be a good one for Charlie, maybe, um, about being able to predict the water levels, you know, um, into the future. You know, can we predict them? Um, are we looking at, you know, a long-term high water levels? Uh, what's the outlook kind of over the next several years? I'm not the expert hydrologist with the Corps, so uh, you know I can just kind of pass on what I what I have gotten from them. Um, you know their uh, water levels bulletin they project out uh, six months, and since water levels are primarily dependent upon inputs to the basin, um, you know that's what their estimates are based on, and the you know the the forecasts for weather just are not that accurate when you look out. Um, certainly beyond six months, but even kind of in the latter part of that, you know, three to six months range, you know, th their estimates become much wider kind of at that point of what, what, um, what water levels might be. So I guess to answer the question, no, there's really no, there's no definitive way to project water levels, you know, uh, what they're going to be in the future. Um, in general, you know, the Corps hydraulics and hydrology staff, uh, seem to think that, you know, a high water level is going to be around for a while, you know, until there is a prolonged period of, of um, precipitation that's really below average. Thanks. Okay, thank you. A um, couple questions here about how Eagle and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers work together to approve permits. Do you guys work together or is it two separate processes? How does that work? I'd say for the most part, it, it is separate, but we do communicate regarding projects. So we do communicate via email or sometimes it's a phone call if it's a little bit of a different project. Um, sometimes Eagle staff may have a better availability to get out on site and take photographs. So we'll exchange field notes if that assists in their review. Um, but for the most part, I, th I think it's a, a pretty independent review, but, but we do communicate. All right. Yeah, so this is Charlie. I'll just, I'll, oh, go ahead, Charlie. I, yeah, I'll just echo what Corey said that, you know, Eagle is the primary, they're the kind of entry into the door because it's, uh, we're using their My Waters website. So they will get their application first. They do pass it on to the Corps. Um, and then there are independent reviews from there on. But we certainly do communicate back and forth about, you know, one another's, one another's knowledge. And the Corps does, in a lot of cases, rely on, um, we're fortunate to have Eagle staff that were able to get out to, to sites and um, and kind of pass that information on to the core. Thanks. All right. Can Eagle deny a permit if they deem that the homeowners could move their home back rather than apply for shoreline protection? So uh, yes, that could. So part of the decision making criteria in the statute is, you know, to consider what alternatives are. And so 
in a situation where a homeowner could move their home back, that, that certainly is a possibility. Um, we don't deny a lot of permits, and usually that's because we try to work with people throughout the permitting process to get to something that does meet the statutory criteria and is permittable. And so if you look at our numbers, we really uh, deny very few permits, but we do a ton of negotiating during the application process um, to make sure that what we are permitting meets with the statutory requirements are. And so, as I mentioned in my presentation, maybe and I probably didn't do the greatest job, is we're trying to balance those two things. You're trying to balance private property rights with the public trust responsibilities that come along with regulation along the lakeshore. So, um, we would rarely get to the point of doing a denial, but that is part of the consideration is what alternatives do you have? Okay. Uh, as shown in the first talk, there is over 40 years of data indicating that current new construction and zoning regulations are deficient with respect to beaches. What is being done to correct this from a regulatory or zoning perspective? This guy, I can take a shot at that. Great. Part of our work with Eagle is to, in creating this 80-year look at the shoreline, is to then go around to communities that are interested in updating their master plans to begin to incorporate some of these softer solutions as well as an understanding of what properties would be vulnerable. So we have a team that, that consists of uh, planners, uh, an attorney, um, science people, um, and regulatory folks um, that work together to deliver kind of these in-person, up until the COVID virus, they were in-person workshops at various places. We've done four or five along Lake, Lake uh, Michigan, uh, a few uh, on Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair. Um, this year, we're targeting, as I said, Lake Superior um, to go to planning commissions and, and local um, regulatory agencies and, and, and work with them on what structures are vulnerable um, under really three climate scenarios. Uh, we call it the lucky scenario that if lake levels, and this gets back to a previous question, if lake levels um, suddenly go low, um, and what would be the lucky scenario and what structures are, are in danger? The likely scenario is kind of average water levels and average storminess. And then the perfect storm scenario is what we're in now, high water levels and very intense storms. Again, what, what structures, according to their current master plan, um, would would be vulnerable in those types of areas and how can they change their zoning codes to minimize that that vulnerability and to the previous question on on future water levels um the prediction for michigan is warmer and wetter um, about 10 times more water uh, is transported in the atmosphere above the great lakes um, in the form of evaporation and precipitation then flows out the St. Lawrence Seaway. So the vast majority of what controls our water levels are storm tracks and, and how much of that water is deposited in precipitation on the Great Lakes and how much of that water that the atmosphere carries uh, is evaporated back off. So warmer implies more evaporation, wetter implies more precipitation. So it's difficult to forecast 20, 30, 50 years into the future. Um, but what we do believe is going to happen is that lake levels probably are not going to, as originally thought, continue to fall uh, in long time spans, but probably will stay about where they are now. But the fluctuations, both higher and lower, will probably become more intense. That's the latest that I've heard on the climate modeling side. So, Jim, I think that was a really good um, question to sort of wrap everything together because it really gets at, like, how do we make better decisions in the in the future such that we're not, you know, there were questions as we followed through here about why are you 
um, you know, why are you doing this or why are you doing that? And what we want to do is get to the point where we're making better decisions where, where we're not having to make a decision be, between doing something that we know is not good for the lake shore uh, or losing someone's home or losing a road or losing some piece of critical infrastructure. And so I think that really kind of wraps around um, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today is we, we you know, we're, we need to make better decisions in the future. As Dr. Meadows just said, the predictions right now is we're going to see this uh, again. And so how do we, when we're, when we're faced with this again, how do we make better decisions where we're not put in the exact same situation and make these impossible decisions? All right. Thanks, Jared. I think that is a, a good time uh, for us to basically call it and start wrapping it up here because we went quite a bit over and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to get out there and enjoy the beautiful evening. Uh, it's a beautiful here in Lansing. I don't know what it's like in other parts of the state, but um, I'm sure everybody wants to get out there and enjoy it. So, um, Jared, do you have any other comments that you wanted to make or anybody else on the team here? No, I, I'm all set. If anyone else wants to close up, I'm happy to do it. But uh, I really do appreciate all. I want to thank all the panelists. And Jim, I know that you are back there fiercely pushing buttons. I know it's hard to manage uh, seven <laughs> panelists. So appreciate all the people, the 300 people that stuck with us this time, too. So uh, I that's it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Jared. And thank you to Jared, Corey, John, Guy, Charlie, Dan, and Brian for all coming on tonight and helping to answer questions. A lot of your questions uh, were answered directly by our panelists. I've, I sent them over to them. So hopefully you got your question answered. If you didn't, um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, we do have a record of all the questions that came in and we'll get back to people as appropriate. And in my follow-up email I send out, you'll have a, uh, I'll give you guidance on how to get a hold of people if you have very specific questions uh, for our whole team here. Uh, and just want to remind everybody that we did record the webinar and I will put a link to it so you can watch it later uh, out on our YouTube channel actually, and I'll send you all a link to that as soon as, this, as it's available. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight and have, have a great evening.